Welcome to episode 70 of the Cashflow Connections podcast. The topic for today is how to avoid cognitive biases when making investment decisions. Today, we're going to discuss some of the major mental challenges that even extremely experienced investors face when making decisions about how to allocate their capital. We all have these little quirks in our thinking that either consciously or unconsciously affect the way we're thinking about a particular investment. And these quirks can be very deep-seated in our thought process. And because of that, it can be hard for us to identify them and even harder for us to reduce their impact in the way we decide to invest our hard-earned capital. I'll give you an example. If you log into your bank account every morning as part of your morning routine, and when you log in, you always see that you've got uh, some cash sitting there, it's not earning anything, it may eat at you all day. And therefore, you may be more willing to invest in something that isn't really a good fit just because you're trying to get that capital reinvested. This would be an example of a cognitive bias that could significantly impact your investment decisions over the long term, and that is the kind of thing we want to talk about today. So in the discussion, we're going to start off by talking about a really bad deal and how cognitive biases led to this person making a really big bet on someone that they probably shouldn't have made a bet on and how this resulted in them actually losing a significant amount of money and what we can learn from this whole situation. Then we talk about some of the actual biases that can come up frequently for investors. We're going to talk about economic biases. We're going to talk about biases related to mentors that you may have, people that you look up to. We're also going to talk about intelligence bias. And this is something that our guest mentions 80% or so of the population thinks that they're above average intelligence. So what does that tell you about society? What does that tell you about the people that you're investing with? It's something to consider. Then there's another side of that coin. The other intelligence bias is something that really happens quite frequently in the real estate space. You're dealing with a lot of really intelligent people and some extremely smart people, they simply just don't let external stimulus in. They don't let other people affect their thinking. Part of this is because that's what's allowed them to be successful in the first place. But sometimes when there is data that is counter to the way that they think, they ignore it rather than accept it and alter their thought process. Overall, this is really an interesting conversation about a topic that should certainly be addressed in the investment space, but it's very underrepresented. Now, don't forget, if you had enjoyed a couple episodes, don't forget to leave a review in iTunes. This is by far the easiest way to increase the show's visibility because it's the first thing that people look at when they're skimming shows, trying to see if they want to check out an episode or two. As you may have noticed, the podcast space has gotten very saturated over the last year, and I really am confident that the content that we're putting out on this program deserves to be up there with the biggest and the best. So the easiest way to do that is to leave a review. So you haven't yet, make sure to go to the podcast app, search Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast, then just simply scroll down to the bottom, leave an honest review, two or three sentences. It's pretty much all we ask, and you can enjoy all this awesome content for free. All right, hope you enjoyed the episode. How's it going, everyone? Our guest for today is Steve Setlich, who is a full-time passive and semi-active investor. Steve has a significant amount of experience investing in real estate and real estate-related vehicles. He has been investing in a variety of asset classes since 2011 and has intimate knowledge of a broad spectrum of investment opportunities and structures, as well as the marketplace as a whole. But more than anything, uh, Steve and I have had over the years, you know, what I believe to be a lot of really interesting conversations about the mental game of investing. And I wanted to provide a platform for us to discuss this topic because I think it's something that's not really talked enough about, but it can be very, very important, especially when things become very challenging. So Steve, thanks again for coming on. Oh, thank you, Hunter. Looking forward to it. So I, I want to talk a lot about, you know, some of that content we've discussed over the years and over the years. But before we do that, Tell us a little bit about your background. I want to start with you know, how you ended up becoming an entrepreneur and how that ended up transitioning into being a passive or semi-active investor. I started out as a chiropractor probably 30 years ago because I had an interest in nutrition. And then as paperwork became more burdensome and the red tape got worse, I got out of it and decided to get into investing. Interesting. And were you originally drawn towards real estate or were you focused just on investing in general? I mean, how did you end up ending up in the real estate sector specifically? I had done investing in general. 
hired managers with equities, and yet it wasn't very predictable. And even though I thought I was hiring the best guys, it didn't always work out the way I wanted it to. So I thought, hmm, real estate would be good. I knew somebody who had bought 10 single family houses in Lancaster. And her husband was a contractor and he rehabbed them and they were making great cash flow on it. So I said, okay, let me look into that. Interesting. And is that really how you were entered into the market in terms of those single family type of houses in, in Lancaster and California as a whole? Well, I looked at that and then I thought, I said, well, maybe I should do, I don't want to own 10 different ones. I go, maybe I should buy an apartment complex. So I went online and looked for somebody to teach me that stuff. And I found somebody there. And unfortunately, being a newbie, I didn't do any background search. I didn't talk to any other investors or anything. And I got involved with someone who I wish I hadn't gotten involved with. And so I signed up for their mentor group, which went on for 12 months and bought some properties that were that needed complete to the studs rehab. And it just was a nightmare. I ended up selling them for a loss. So that's my original first story into real estate. And yet I'm still here though. So I guess, you know, it's a good outcome. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely something I want to touch on because I think that people, especially now with the change in the marketplace, the really the popularity of the podcast world, the popularity of online investor groups, et cetera, what you just described sounds like something that you wouldn't think would be typical, but it was very, very, very typical back then. And and just from a, a time frame perspective, this is around 2011 or so, 2010 maybe? Probably, yeah, that sounds correct. So it sounds like you you know, went to a mentorship program. How did this deal go wrong? I mean, what was it that, were you unprepared for the amount of rehab that needed to take place or was the market shifting still? Or what was kind of some of the signs where things started to imply that the wheels might come off? Oh, well, first of all, the mentor, I don't believe had any background in doing rehab at this level, even though they claim they did. And second of all, I wasn't prepared for it. It had no concept of what it would take even though I had a partner on the ground there too, and he didn't have any concept of what it would take. And the cost just got out of hand. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the market shifting. It was just ignorance from the get-go, for lack of a better term, I think. Yeah. I mean, I understand I had an experience really when the market was really favorable just because of the the lack of the bandwidth uh, between an on-site manager and me as an owner. And it can be really challenging if you are out of state and you know, just flying back and forth, the gross dollars start to really add up and it can make those things go sideways. And my investment was not even in a significant rehab. If that had been a complete moving part, uh, I would have been in a really challenging financial situation. Thankfully, it was a simple investment, but I can certainly see how that could take place. So what ended up being the way that you were able to, to get out of that opportunity and, and tell us a little bit like the size and scope you mentioned it was basically just down to the studs did you end up going forward with that rehab or you know tell us a little bit of details about how you ended up you know going through that and then getting out of that no i just had a realization when i was on vacation um one day that i was throwing good money after bad and i called up the broker who actually sold it to me and said can you get rid of this thing for me and he said yes and i just put it back on the market and said all right time just to move on yep yeah. Got it. And so the rehab never took place then? Well, it did partially, but it was throwing good money after bad. Totally get it. Yeah. Totally get it. The money pit, so to speak. Yeah. And I, yeah, th- that's something that if it's not money, it's time. Mm-hmm. And that can also be equally challenging where you're saying, okay, look, I may get out of this with my shirt, but it's going to take me a year of my time. And my time is actually quite valuable to me and to maybe some other people as well. So that's kind of the math you have to start to do there. So, mm-hmm. What were some of the lessons you've learned? Obviously, you've been involved in a ton of transactions since then, and we can talk about some of those as well. But you know, retrospectively, hindsight 2020, what are some of the key takeaways that you had during this experience, and, and what can some of the investors or listeners do to avoid something like this in the future? Real simple, basic stuff. Get lots of references, call them all, talk to them for at least half an hour, Do a complete Google search on the person. Go through several different pages. Get a complete background with criminal, financial, everything you can possibly get from them. The financial is also important, I think, because you can see if they're having any credit problems at that time. And, you know, I wouldn't want to invest with somebody or have someone mentor me who can't manage their own finance. Yeah. And then the other thing is 
go to real estate meetup groups or real estate groups and just talk to a bunch of people. Just pull, you know, three or four of them to the side and say, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? And bounce ideas off of them. I think if I had done all of those things, I never would have even bothered reading any of the materials that I initially got from them. So that's my big <laughs> takeaway. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely can relate to that. And it's something that, you know, we all learn. But now, you know, after the fact, it sounds like something that's so simple. Again, I think there has been some changes in the online space that will facilitate that. But mm-hmm. even at the time, you know, I mean, I did a rich dad, poor dad coaching program. It was mm-hmm. not expensive. I mean, it was not the ones that most people hear about the 50,000, 100,000, you know, it was a tenth of that price. It was, I think it was about $4,000. But still, I got a lot out of it because what I got out of it was going to real estate meetup groups. But in terms of the actual real estate experience that the coach that I paid for had, it was very, very limited, right? As soon as I did my first deal, I had more experience than that person. Having said that, that $4,000 investment really did help me get connected with some really influential people, including yourself, but it could have been not the case, right? It could have been, if I had been sold on $50,000 program, I might have made the choice that that was worth the investment. So, you know, you got to be really careful out there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So once that did take place and you started being more active and you know, what were some of the the deals that you really started to hit your stride on and feel more comfortable with and, and really start to focus in terms of, you know, your own investing strategy, building your own portfolio? Probably three things, hard money lending and buying single family houses. I bought in Las Vegas when the market was low and then I was going to hold them for a while and then got great offers from hedge funds coming in to buy them out, sold them and rolled them over to new build properties in Texas. So that helped in the hard money. And then also after those, I started doing some syndication through our good friend, Jeremy Roll. Mm-hmm. Which is how we got connected originally is going to those meetup groups. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So the Phoebe meeting, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay, cool. Well, we'll go into some of the details of those specific investments later because I, I definitely want to do here, you know, how things mm-hmm. are going with those as well. But one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is to talk about the mind game of investing, particularly thinking about your own thinking as an investor. I wanted to give you an opportunity to discuss this and when this really started to be a big portion of, you know, your mental game and when when this started to be a big part of your work as an investor. I would say, boy, probably a couple years ago, maybe two years ago, I got exposed to some groups of like-minded investors. And so there's a lot of exchange going back and forth, thought processes from most of the people I consider smarter than myself. And I'm listening to them talk and I'm just going, well, how do I know what really works, what's really true? And I picked up a book by uh, Charlie Munger called Poor Charlie's Almanac. He's uh, Warren Buffett's partner. And in there, he had a whole section on thinking, how investors have lousy thinking, you know, thought processes. In fact, you can see it on YouTube. It was a lecture. I think he gave it at Stanford or Harvard or one of those places. And I remembered reading Berkshire Hathaway's annual reports years before, and the rational just seemed to make so much sense. I'm going, well, heck, how do I become more like that? Obviously, I can never become that way, but how do I become more like that? And so from reading Charlie's book, that really got me on the path. It was, I had to actually read maybe a paragraph or a page at a time and then think for another 15 to 20 minutes to go, okay, how does this apply to me? And the big challenge is, is most of the time when we have biases like that is we don't know that we have them. So it took a lot of thinking for me to say, okay, where is this bias? How am I applying it? And can I remove it or mitigate it? Because usually in most cases from everybody I've read, you can't completely get rid of them. The best you can do is become aware of them and hopefully mitigate them to some degree. Yeah, absolutely. And and what are some of those examples of, you know, what those biases are, those weaknesses that you see in investors or potentially in yourself that that book or other similar books kind of brought to light? Well, there's a couple of other books too. And I, I know you'll have this uh, printed up there for people. I'd like to go over those just because they're so good with uh, Charlie Munger's he booked the Poor Charlie's Almanac, and he has the psychology of human misjudgment. And so they have the full speech on YouTube. So, you know, no need to buy the book for 50 bucks. You can listen to that multiple times on YouTube. 
There's another book called Influence by Robert Caldini, and Charlie has actually given this book to all of his children and grandchildren, I believe. Then there's another book called The Little Book of Stupidity. Very simple, like under $10 on Amazon. And this guy just went through all the biases that are out there, just something that can be read multiple times. And another one was Investing in Real Estate Private Equity by Sean Cook. The guy's real name is Paul Caseberg, and he works for a very large syndicator out of San Diego that's been around, I think, 30 years, never had any losses doing multifamily. And he wrote under a pseudonym and just really exposed all the weaknesses and thought processes that go in to people who are investing in syndication. And then another one that I like real well is called Thinking in Bet, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts by Annie Duke. And she was probably, I guess, the most successful poker player, female poker player ever. But she also has a master's degree in psychology from Duke. I believe, or Pennsylvania. And her whole concept really opened me up to the idea that we never know 100% whether any assumption is completely true or not. And so you have to apply percentages to it. And that really helped my uh, thinking process. But going back to biases that I see, I can only speak for for myself. So I'm going to kind of go through them as I see them as they relate to me. The first one is the confirmation bias, which basically means I look for data confirm what I already believe is true. In other words, I don't look for anything that disagrees with my assumption. And worse is the more I like a deal or an operator, or in my case, this weakness, the more greed kicks in and I say, oh, the higher the yield, the more I look for data to validate that. So to to mitigate this, um, right from the start, instead of even looking at the returns, I start looking for the reasons why the deal and or the operator will not work. And so The challenge that happens with disrupting or confronting your biases is it puts me in a constant state of emotional discomfort because now I'm in doubt and we all like to think, oh, okay, we know the answer to this or we know the answer to that. That's why we have biases. It allows us to make quick decisions there. Mm -hmm. And so it's forced me to welcome this feeling of discomfort. And realizing that the more I can get in that state of discomfort of having doubt, that means I am probably doing more thorough process and a better decision-making process with that. So that's the first one that I can think of. Second one would be economic bias, which of course is mine. And I love the shiny ball called higher yield. And so to mitigate this, I have to make it a point, not e- like I said before, not even to look at those, the yields when I look at the deal first and just critique it. Another thing I happen to have is a fear of losing value to inflation. I believe that inflation is higher than what the government tells us. And so because of that, I realized that the challenge that comes up is I keep thinking, I go, well, I've got to get invested right now because if I don't invest, I'm going to be losing to inflation, where in reality is, is if I can wait until the cycle drops, let's say I can buy it 100 to 150 basis points lower on a cap rate over the lifetime of the investment, let's say it's syndication, that's about a 7 to 10% more annualized return on top of your basic 12 to 14% return. So it's forced me to say, okay, you got to sit on the sidelines, stay in cash. And I'm still dealing with that one. And then the other one is economic bias that I see in operators. And most of them, they have to keep doing deals to make money. So they're biased to keep bringing deals out, and they're not necessarily the best deals. And I don't think they do that intentionally, but they will say, oh, this is the best deal, but based upon where we are right now in the market. But where we are right now in the market may not be the best time to buy anything. So what I found was from reading the book by uh, Sean Cook, the one above, I talked about private equity, is that the economics of the syndicators are very rarely aligned with that of investors, and it takes them weeding through it to kind of discern that and find that out. So that's something that has been a kind of a challenge for me. Yeah. The other I, one. I, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, those are perfect. Go you know, keep going. Yeah. The other one is the operator or mentor bias. And so one of the problems with this is I tend to believe certain mentors and operators because after a while, I think they're the best ones that's out there. And so now I try to look for errors in anything that they say or tell me. And 
I also look for contrarian views, whether it's with the groups that I discuss these things with or on online sites, opinions, and news that go against what these operators or mentors uh, say. And so that's another big form of bias that I see out there. The Probably the biggest one I had to confront, which was the most uncomfortable for me, was intelligence bias. And I guess they've done some studies where something like 80 or 90 percent of the population think, thinks that they are above average intelligence. Well, <laughs> of course, if you run the numbers, that doesn't work. And so fortunately for me, the more I started talking to other investors, I began to realize, you know, some of these people are very smart, extremely smart. And I had to realize that I am probably in the lower percentage of everybody that I deal with as far as intelligence. And therefore, I've got to read more, study more, think more, ask more questions, and spend more time on due diligence. Now, that was a big blow to my ego, of course, but it's probably one of the best things that I've ever done as far as investing goes. Reminds me of a quote from a gang member over at Homeboys Institute in L.A. He says, if I'm humble, I won't stumble. So I've been trying to apply that a bit more as far as that goes. (laughs) The other thing, too, is the intelligent bias in mentors and operators. And I don't remember the exact name of this bias, but there's research that shows that people that are above average intelligence have a bias in their thinking and decision process where they don't notice that they're making bad decisions because they have been so successfully being intelligent in the past. And so that's something that's Kind of hard for me to catch, but I always keep looking for it and trying to discern if that's really going on and if there's a way to mitigate that. That's pretty much the list of what I can think of. Although there's, if you go and read those books, there's probably, I'm going to guess, five to ten times more biases out there. Those are the main ones that stick to my mind, though. Yeah, I really appreciate you going to that level of detail and especially kind of sharing with us some of the ones that you see uh, yourself struggling with. Um, that's not something that maybe some people are willing to do. In fact, that's kind of one of the reasons this conversation is interesting is that it's something that's not often talked about. Uh, one of the things that I definitely wanted to circle back on is you mentioned Annie Duke, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm actually familiar with her uh, because she is a you know, poker player. I have a background in playing poker and she's actually Howard Letterer's uh, sister. Howard Letterer is, is unquestionably one of the best players you know, of the previous online era. But also, you know, mentioned Warren Buffett. I think that's something that he has really done a good job of making clear is that even very ethical people can have their judgment clouded if incentives are, are misaligned. In the sense Absolutely. that we have, you know, both you and I have found ourselves trying to make deals pencil, even if it's own, just for our own personal portfolio, trying to avoid that inflation tax that you mentioned earlier, trying to say, you know, look, if we relax this underwriting standard and this underwriting standard, we can make this deal work. And then you really have to stop and say, man, if we're in the process of trying to make a deal work, it's probably the worst time to try to make a deal work. And that's what happens every <laughs> single time. That, Hunter, that, that is a quote. <laughs> it can go on the top of your letterhead. That that makes so much sense. That that is well put, beautifully phrased. I love I that. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, but here's one that I think this isn't something that I took seriously until relatively recently. The intelligence bias, and there's a lot of different versions of this, but I think that you know I am very, very inspired by, compelled by, and and love interacting with people that are extremely intelligent on a raw basis. I like people that where things come to them quickly, where they figure things out quickly. And and usually that comes with a really high IQ or basically if they don't have necessarily a high IQ, they have a very high business IQ. The problem with this is that when you have that, you know, as a life, you've lived your whole life like this, the way that you've been able to succeed is basically not allowing other people's information in to your brain because you don't want them usually they're not as intelligent as you in this situation, to give you guidance because they're not usually able to give you appropriate guidance. And so the way you've been able to be successful for most people, the way that most people have been able to be successful is by not listening to the vast majority of people. Now, this can become a real challenge if people are right 
And you need to accept that there is external sources out there that can guide you appropriately. So one of the intelligence biases or the version of an intelligence bias is by being intelligent and therefore not allowing external census, other people's great ideas, to affect or impact your perspective. And that's something that if you're hanging around ultra high net worth people, you can find that very commonly where it's like, dude, you're not listening. You're not seeing the science um, the way that the other people are. And um, that's not exactly what you were touching on, but I think it's really fascinating as well. Well, I think it's a part of it. And it's very important. And one thing I learned at first, I doubt it was from Christina Suter, who's been on your podcast before, is she says she specifically looks for podcasts and news sources that go against her underlying belief on things. And at first I thought like, oh man, I don't want to read that. But then the more I began to read those, the more I found myself becoming a better thinker and a better being, doing better due diligence on a lot of things and and looking at things from different viewpoints, which gave me more insight, made me a more insightful investor, I'd have to say. So good points with that. Yeah. And so I guess, and again, I really appreciate going to those details because it's definitely something that I'll think about. And again, the book is the the psychology of human mismanagement. Charlie Mungo will make sure to mention that in the show notes page. But when you start to hear this, a lot of this has to do with basically second guessing your gut instincts. You mentioned earlier that biases allow us to make decisions quickly enough to stay alive. Um, when it comes to investing, overanalyzing certain decisions or thought processes can leave you in a position where you're not getting deals done. How do you balance thinking about your thinking versus taking action and investing or either actively or passively or even passing on specific investment opportunities? Boy, that is that is a very tough question for me because I'm always trying to improve on the due diligence that I do. So because of trying to improve, I'm all over the place sometimes is, you know, a new idea will spring up or I'll read something new and I'll fall and I'll go down that rabbit hole. So I actually spend a lot more time now doing due diligence, especially since I've accepted that I must do more work because I'm probably under average in intelligence compared to the average accredited investor out there. And Fortunately, I have several groups of other investors that I'll bounce ideas off of and do due diligence with them. And this has been the absolute best thing that I ever did. I cannot speak highly enough about it because that's where I've gotten the complete new thought processes coming at me. And so I still make decisions. It just takes longer because I realize that I need that extra time to do real good due diligence. And also I need that extra time to gather more information, whether it's from other investors or it's from the data that's being laid out for me. So I hope that answers your question. Is that kind of where you're going with that? Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, the, sure answered it. the whole point is it's really challenging, Yeah, right? It's challenging, especially when you're trying to balance keeping relationships, maintaining those relationships, trying to balance, you know, your own personal investment size which, I mean, I understand your investment processes is very similar to a private equity type of process. And, you know, you and I have conducted due diligence on firms together, and it takes time to deal with us. Uh, we're not the easiest investors to deal with. In fact, if you're looking for 50 or even $100,000, there's a lot of easier places to go. So oh, yeah, when, when, when people realize that, they may end up going that direction. Hopefully, in the sponsors that we work with, they want to build relationships for the long term and realize that it's not only you know you and I's investment amounts, but our network, which can be quite significant for them. And I mean, to put some numbers on it, just to give listeners kind of the way that I think about this. So I usually can represent, you know, somewhere to the tune of 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 times a typical investment amount that an operator might be willing to accept or be interested in accepting. But it's probably going to be 20 or 50 or 100 times more challenging to deal with me than dealing with a typical investor. And what I try to do is instead of it being a one-to-one -one ratio, I try to do about 80%. So if a typical investor will will do you know two hours of due diligence, and I'm thinking of investing you know cumulatively through my network, a uh, hundred thousand, basically a hundred of those, instead of it being uh, two hundred hours, I'll try to be like 120 hours, and that time is not all put in with the sponsor, but it's like cumulatively over the duration of the investment process. A lot of that time is done myself. The point is mm -hmm. analysis paralysis is a real challenge. And if you put 
a sponsor through a ton of nonsense, they'll find another way to get that $50,000. And it's not something that's inconsequential. I am 100% confident. I know for a fact that there's at least one deal where I was really excited about investing and I sent the list of questions and the types of disclosures that I was looking for in the actual documents and they just said, you know what, the fund's filled. And I, I, got, I didn't get to invest in a great opportunity because of that. And Steve, I, I'm sure that's happened to you as well just because you're more sophisticated and, and therefore more of a challenge to deal with. <laughs> you're a great guy. <laughs> yeah, but it, it can be irritating. No, I was just thinking today there's a hard money fund that um, I've invested with and I was going to refer it off to some of the other investors that I communicate with on these things. And I was looking at the questions I asked this guy and I'm going, my God, I can't believe the patience this man has. I keep coming back with more and more stuff. And he keeps answering him, so which is good. And I said, okay, this is a guy that I want to invest with for the rest of my life. Yep. You know? So and that kind of goes back to another point. You were asking about, you know, how do I determine whether I'm going to take action or I'm going to pass on an opportunity or get that paralysis you talked about. And I kind of like Warren Buffett's idea of only making 20 investments in your whole lifetime. He, he was referring to stocks, of course, but I kind of think of having 20 operators that I work for. Now, the flip side to that is that I need to be diversified because I can't determine or predict all the risks. So looking at that, I've kind of come to the conclusion that I'd be happy with 20 just really good sponsors to invest with over my lifetime. And so that's only 5% of my portfolio with any one sponsor. And so because of this, I know that I'm going to have to spend more time looking at deals, sponsors, and also pass on the vast majority of them. And I'm okay with that, you know, of spending that extra time and possibly missing out on good deals because I'm sticking to a very strict criteria before I take any action. I remember. I don't know who it was, but somebody says that patience is the investor's friend, whereas greed, fear, and boredom is his enemy. So I'm dealing with those all the time. Every morning I wake up and deal with those guys. Certainly. Could you give me an example of an opportunity that you were recently considering investing in that you felt like you were being swayed because of a particular bias? I mean, we don't even get into specifics of the deal itself, but what were you, you know, feeling swayed by? And then what did you end up uncovering during due diligence that allowed you to kind of see that bias or whatever example it is that is most applicable? Yeah, there was a retail deal that I was looking at just last week. It was built in 2008, large outdoor space with all credit tenants purchased at a 9.3 cap, 98% occupied, 11% cash on cash year one, 6% LTV, 40% under appraised value. And I try to read some of those books on biases every day or every other day so that stuff fresh at the top of my mind. And Annie Duke had some research that says that we make decisions and then we back it up looking for facts. So immediately I thought, oh, I saw 11% cash on cash, made my decision that this has got to be great and started looking for facts to back it up. So then I had to drill down. So what I started doing with drilling down is I said, well, what are the credit ratings for the tenants? And have they been dropping? And so I did some research online, found out none of them are A-rated credits. I go, hmm. Then I said, well, then maybe we should find out what the sales are per foot and where do they fall on a scale of zero to 10 compared with other stores nationwide. Never got that data. Then I said, well, are they overexposed with that? And so I started looking online when I was looking at their credit ratings and some of them were, I mean, hugely leveraged. I mean, up to the tune of like 95% the companies themselves that were mm. renting the space. And then I said, well, is there a logical reason that they could go the way of Sears? And so 20 to 30% of them had store closings in 2018. So there's an indicator they possibly could. And then another thing I was going to ask, but never got around to it because some other things popped up was how much did the store average sales drop during the Great Recession? And would that be able to cover rent? And then also I wanted to know the comps or other like properties in the area as their response was to the Great Recession as far as occupancy and rent changes and things like that. So I came up with these different questions. Long story short, I walked away from it. The main reason was I was talking to the group of people that I confer with on these sort of things. And somebody mentioned that the equity stack wasn't that good because there is a preferred equity because they're bringing a REIT in on top of it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. 
essentially 78% combined loan to value. And I'm, well, this is part of the cycle. I'm not too good with that, especially with these guys that aren't, even though they're credit tenants, they weren't that good. So I had to drill down and look for things that could go wrong specifically to overcome my economic bias of that incredible cash on cash and that very high cap rate. Yeah, that's a really good point, especially about the preferred equity. I think that that's something we haven't really talked a lot about in the show, but essentially what that means is that your investment is junior to the performance of not only the loan, but also an additional equity position. It depends on the terms. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. And so really what the terms are, it depends on the deal, but let's say you know the loan needs to be paid off first and then the preferred equity has to receive their 8, 10, 11, 12 types of uh, percent return and then anything above that is split to the the investor. Now, the leverage position can be very favorable or very aggressive, however you want to look at that, and therefore the returns can be very high. The challenge, though, is that if that preferred equity doesn't hit that yield that they need to, then you are not going to get paid uh, because you're you're junior to that performance. So that's definitely an interesting thing to talk about. We should probably have someone to talk about that part of the capital stack, though it's not something that's used that frequently. And it's still important, especially given where we are in the cycle. Okay, so we've talked about one that you passed along. Let's talk about one that you recently invested in or something that you found that checked off those boxes and you felt you were able to avoid those bias traps and, and still made sense on an investment basis. Well, there was an Airbnb deal that had a very high ROI. And so, of course, immediately my economic bias set in or greed, for lack of a better term. And so I saw that right away. I go, okay. I said, so, so there's probably some problem here. I got to look into this and see what's going on. And so I went back to the deal and structured it so that the investor capital was returned right away. In other words, I said, okay, I'm probably missing something because of my economic bias here. Even though I'm looking for it, I'm probably missing it and can't find it. So what can I do to mitigate my bias and my, for lack of a better term, ignorance about other elements here. And so we arranged the deal so that all capital for investors, which would have been me, was returned before any profit split, which was very favorable. And so that's one way that I managed that. The other thing we did too was, as we were going forward to temper that high return bias, I stepped back and I got some numbers for what happened during the Great Recession in that market for hotels, because of course, Airbnb wasn't around during the Great Recession. I think they were formed in 2008. And then we did a stress test specifically for vacancy, vacancy and also rent rates on hotels in that area, and then took those numbers and ran them through our projections. And we still came out with very sustainable cash flow. So that's how I managed the economic bias I had going in on that thing by stepping back and just doing more due diligence and then structuring it, knowing that I probably couldn't even completely override my economic bias. Right. Yeah. It's basically saying, look, the deal looks solid right now, but there's got to be some margin for error. I don't know how much experience you have in the Airbnb sector, but you know, as you're entering a new sector, you're saying, look, we have to structure this for maximum downside protection. And there's a little bit of unknowns in that area well, of Airbnb, but um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh my God, Hunter, there's a lot of unknowns in that. And so you bring up a good point, which I forgot to mention is what we did was we found an Airbnb operator who had quite a bit of experience, multiple places across the country, great references, great numbers and everything. And we brought him in as an equity partner so that he was completely aligned with our interests with it. And so that's one way it made us feel more secure. That's one way we mitigated the risk that we knew that had to be there with Airbnb. Right. And you're overcoming your economic bias because that's not cheap to bring in someone as a partner as opposed to just a non-site manager. But if you're able to do that, you know, you're know you kind of headed in the right direction there. Um, other than the Airbnbs, uh, what are some of the other investments that you're currently looking at? Um, like the profile, the market, the risk profile, generally, you know, the big picture thesis, what's your most of your investments, what are they going towards right now? Primarily hard money funds is what I'm looking for. So I look for the following, uh, like non-judicial state, under 60% LTV, first only, non-leveraged funds, three to six month lockup period, hopefully a one to two week redemption notice, a good recession plan in place, 
underwriting that's conservative and logical, very low default rate with a high cure rate. The longer the history, the better. And I do not look at the return until I look at all those other things. And so mm. hard money and primarily is because I don't see anything else out there that makes any sense right now unless, you know, doing some small Airbnb, but that has to be with really trusted people. And I'm still working through the first two that we have to um, get them up and going before we move on to any more of those. Makes sense. I'm been investing in debt now through the, through the entire cycle. And I'm currently looking at a way to structure something so that we can allow a lot of investors to be involved. I really like the hard money. I think it's a great way to keep your capital reinvested, even if you're only able to get a six, seven, eight percent return. I think that's much mm-hmm. better than zero. And a lot of investors have so much capital sitting on the sidelines. So for the listeners out there, we're definitely in the process of putting together something involving that. And um, I'll definitely Good. look forward to keeping you posted on something like that. Yeah, let me know, Hunter, because I'll definitely be interested in that. And you know, you bring up a good point. The six, seven, or eight percent is good. And what I found was that the uh, hard money funds that I invested with, those guys that had the lower returns, what was happening was they were actually tightening up on their underwriting. Mm-hmm. In other words, they were making it tougher for people to qualify for loans. So in return, they had to offer lower interest rates, but they would get the better borrower, which is exactly what you want as we're going into a recession. Now, when I say going into a recession, I don't know when that's going to be, but it will be coming sometime. And so I want to make sure that people or the hard money funds that I work with are thinking logically about those sort of things. Certainly. Yeah. And I, I think it's a good point. And I really like the idea that focusing on the underwriting first and looking at the returns later, definitely critical, uh, especially right now. So are you currently investing? It sounds like you're doing some passive or semi-passive in the sense of the Airbnbs and then I would say passive in terms of the the notes as well. Are you looking at anything active or on the more active side of things? Uh, no, I don't see anything out there that makes any sense. The only thing I can say is on some duplexes that we are working on um, actually lowering rent for people in exchange for them, uh, you know, signing three to five year leases. Because going back and looking over the cost returns, we realized how high it was. And coming into a recession, we figured if we can be under the market, we'll lock in these people and it'll actually increase our return, even though you wouldn't think so because you're lowering rent. But mm-hmm. over the long term, it'll increase our returns and it will also mitigate the risk of losing tenants during a recession. Not a bad strategy to consider. And if you start to feel the bottom slipping out from under you, that's certainly something that, that people in the business do and they give an offer a discount for a longer term. I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, um, and definitely a good suggestion. So, what time do you think you spend? Given the fact that it doesn't sound like you're that active right now in terms of actually investing, you may be reviewing a lot of deals. How much time do you think you spend doing big picture thesis, mental preparation, as opposed to actual investing and underwriting deals and more of the technical side of real estate? It's hard to say because I probably spend more time studying on the passive side because I feel this is a good time to find operators I want to work with when the next yeah. recession comes. Mm-hmm. And then as far as education, I think everything is education. I try to ask myself before I do anything, what can I learn from this or how can I improve it? Now, I don't always do that, but that's kind of my goal. And so anything from even something as simple as you know, reviewing my book, I, I constantly look at it and go, hmm, what can I learn from this? What's something that I can change here? So education is like nonstop for this. I, on, on a good day, I could probably be working on stuff for 10 to 11 hours and or reading stuff that long. Now, it doesn't happen, you know, five or six days out of the week, but, you know, maybe three days a week, I'll hit that. And wow. still, I feel like there's even more out there to learn from. Yeah, well, that's that's pretty remarkable and it's definitely something that I think a lot of listeners will say, wow, that's uh, you know definitely something to aspire towards because well, there is so let, much. Let me put that in context, though. I wasn't always that way, and there are quite a few days where I go, oh, the heck with this. Where's Netflix? You know, My right. brain is damaged. <laughs> I, I got to pull away from the stuff. But I remember reading that Warren Buffett, when he started out, read 1,000 pages a day. And I said, oh, my gosh. I go, that's incredible. I go, well, maybe I could read 10 or 15 pages a day. And he apparently reads like 500 pages a day now. 
And that's one of the things that both he and Charlie Munger accredited to um, their successes. They just keep pulling in information and data and your brain begins to process and build up a, a database of stuff. And so you can make better decisions that way. And that's why I like the groups that I interact with, because I try to read all their thoughts, even for asset classes like hotels and things that I don't even want to be in or, or deals that I'm not even going to do. I just want to hear, how do other people think? What is their thought process? Does that make sense to me? Can I apply that to something else? I, I'm just curious about those things. Awesome. Well, I, I guess that's you know that's a pretty good summation of the entire conversation. Definitely touched on so much stuff. Definitely something that I'm going to go back and listen to many, many times. Is there anything else that you want to touch on before we jump off, Steve? No. Um, I'd like to say one of my great educational resources has been your podcast, Hunter. Hey. I've learned so much from this. And I have to say the interviews you've done with Jeremy Roll, I've probably listened to three to five times each. And I, there's several interviews. I can't remember other ones that I've listened to multiple times. So they've all been great. And I look forward to them because like you said, you try to do what other podcasts don't do out there. You get down into the real nitty gritty with this stuff and really try to educate people, which I really appreciate. It's been a big help for me. So thank you, Hunter. Well, Steve, that's really an honor to hear and, and I really appreciate and always appreciate your support. So um, thanks again for coming on, Steve. I can't thank you enough. Sure. Take care, Hunter. Talk to you soon. All right, listeners, thanks for checking out the episode. As always, the contact information for our guest will be available in the show notes page, which is hosted on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. Don't forget, if you want access to some of the free goodies that I'm talking about at the beginning of these episodes, like free ebooks, weekly investor emails, and articles about some of the most important investment related topics, make sure that you have created an account with CFC because this stuff is automatically available. You can do this by going to cashflowconnections.com and signing up as an accredited investor. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks again.